We've taken a look at the regulatory authorities who are involved in looking after the work of audit and accountancy. We've also taken a more detailed look at money laundering. There's one more bit of regulation that we need to look at, but it's not the regulation of us, the accountants and auditors. It's the laws and regulations that affect our clients. As auditors, we are constantly told that we need to understand our clients to help understand if their accounts are likely to be right or wrong. From an added value perspective, understanding our clients is useful because if we understand them, we may be in a better position to give them advice on how their systems, their methods might be improved, and presumably that's of use to them. But what we're looking at here is a rather different matter. If I audit a company... How much do I need to know about the laws and regulations that apply to that company in that industry? And why should I need to know anything? I mean, surely the rules and regulations are up to them to sort out. And if they're breaking the rules, it's hardly my problem. Well, as the auditor, it may be an issue that's relevant to me. For example, if they're breaking the rules, there may be some expectation within the law for me as auditor... Number one, to know they're breaking those rules, and number two, to report it to some outside authority. However, there is another issue as well. If my client is breaking any rules at the moment, I need to know that, because if they're breaking significant rules, there must be a significant chance that they're going to get caught and fined. And if they're going to get penalised, and they've been breaking the law already... That means that as at the year end, there is likely to be an obligation to pay those fines. Or in other words, they may well need accruals or provisions in their accounts for the expected amounts that they're going to be penalised. Bit of a tricky one, this, because of course if no one knows they're breaking the law, the probability of them having to pay anything may be fairly small. The moment I insist that their accounts tell the whole world that they've been breaking the law is the moment that the whole world finds out And they will have to pay those fines. So a potentially tricky situation here. Of course, if you have a client who is regularly breaking the rules, your professional ethics may kick in at this moment and make you wonder whether this should, in fact, be your client any longer. But the main issues here are clients who break the rules. Potentially, we may have to report them to an outside authority. And secondly, breaking rules could mean provisions in the accounts. As far as our responsibilities are concerned, if you think your client is breaking the rules, and that does mean, of course, that you will need to understand the main significant rules that apply to your client, your first responsibility is to tell the board of directors. As you should know from your corporate governance knowledge, more likely is that you'll tell the audit committee, part of the board of directors. Because, of course, the main board may be fully aware they're breaking the rules, because they may have chosen to break those rules on purpose. So make sure you tell the board, make sure the company knows it's got a problem, and unless there are any other specific rules about reporting this to an outside body, your job is done. But do consider whether the breaking of rules will lead to the need for provisions or maybe disclosures in the accounts. Apart from that, there's nothing really to know about laws and regulations. It's a fairly minor issue. But as I said, it can come up and has come up from time to time. So let's just note those points down.
one other thing briefly to consider. If your client is significantly breaking the rules, and I mean significantly, do bear in mind this could lead to them being closed down. Either directly, for example, a restaurant with very poor health and safety may be forced to close, or indirectly because the penalties are so big they can't afford to pay them. So do make sure you understand those main rules very well. Now, in that section, I mentioned briefly the fact that if you have a client who is breaking lots of rules, your professional ethics might kick in and make you think about whether you want that client any longer. That means it's time for us to move on in this course and consider ethics in a wider sense. So the next section we will be studying is professional ethics. So, let's get going with some professional ethics. First, the good news. And it is mostly good news when it comes to ethics. You already know everything you need to know. Let me rephrase that. You should already know everything you need to know about professional ethics. Because the knowledge part of this bit of the syllabus is identical to F8. There is nothing new to know. The result is that as we go through the knowledge, I'm going to say a lot of things which you should recognise. We'll talk about threats to objectivity, for example, like self-interest and self-review. We'll talk about the need for confidentiality. And we'll talk about how to handle conflicts of interest. But we can do all of that fairly quickly because you should know it from F8. So how's it different on this paper? Answer, the exam questions, which may be a little more difficult to deal with. And you're going to have to think carefully to break them down in order to get the marks available. As long as you've got good exam technique and as long as that background knowledge is there, it shouldn't be too difficult to score fairly well when ethics comes up. And most students tell me it's the sort of area they're pleased to see on the exam. Do bear in mind, of course, that it's a competitive exam. And if a question looks more attractive, it means that every student is probably finding it easier. And you'll have to work harder to score marks. Ironically, it's sometimes the harder questions where you'll score better. Because the average performance level is so low, anything good you do is bound to get you credit. So let's make sure that if ethics comes up, we can really hammer it and get some good marks out of it. And the best way to do that is not to repeat the F8 knowledge that you should already have. We'll do that in a little while. Let's have a look at a real exam question and see if we can do it. Right, here we go then. A question going back a few years now to December 2001 from the previous syllabus when this paper was called 3.1. But the style of question is fine, and it could quite easily come up, or bits of it could come up, under the current syllabus as well. OK, here we go then. Aventura was an optional question back in December 2001, and is fairly typical of many of the ethics questions we've had over the last few years. Question is, can we do it? Well, only one way to find out. Now, when you do exam questions, when you're practicing and you need to practice questions for this paper, please don't try and learn this by simply listening to me or reading a set of notes. You have to have a go at stuff. When you're doing exam questions, stage one is read the requirements and make sure you understand what it's asking. There's no point reading all the lovely detailed story until you know why it's there. So let's have a look. The requirement says, discuss the ethical issues raised and the actions which might be taken by the auditor in relation to these matters. Notice the word and. This means that there are two separate requirements, which means our answer has got to have two clear sections to make it obvious that we're answering the whole requirement. So, we need... Issues raised, and we need actions which might be taken by the auditor in relation to those issues that we've raised. Right, now we've considered that the requirement has two separate elements to it. We're looking for ethical issues and actions which might be taken by the auditor. Notice it says actions which might be taken. In other words, what are you going to do now? 
We're looking forward. We're not really talking about the past. So we don't want to write things like, the auditor should have, at this point, done this. We've got to talk about what will happen now. Right, we seem to now know what's going on. We know it's about ethics. We've got a bit of ethics stuff in our heads, I hope. So let's take a look and see if we can construct an answer. The question is called Aventura, so all the stories we're about to read are about a single client. But it's been split into three separate areas, so let's treat them separately. Down at the bottom of the question, it says, assume it is the 11th of December 2008. Now, when you sit your actual exam, it won't say, assume it is blah, 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 because when you sit your exam, you are to assume that it is today's date. So just take the date of the exam. But of course, with past exam questions, you might attempt them on any day of any year. And because the dates in the questions are important, we have to give you a date to pretend it is. So, it is currently December 2008. Don't forget what I said right at the start of this course. Watch the dates carefully. OK. Let's see what we can find. Aventura International, a listed company. So, it's listed. It's on a stock exchange. The question is about ethics. Does that make any difference from a non-listed company, for example? Well, there are one or two bits of my ethics knowledge which tell me that there are slight differences when it's listed. For example, if there is a partner involved, as there will be, whoever signs the audit report should be changed, rotated, at least every five years. But unless it tells me about how long the current partner's been doing this, that won't be relevant. There are issues about how big an individual client can be. And if you have a listed client, the rules are tighter. And you may at this point remember some percentages, 5, 10, 15, etc. Again, if it comes up in the question, I'll use it. But only if it comes up. So keep in our minds that it's a listed company, but it may prove to be totally irrelevant. What do they do? They manufacture and wholesale... So they sell in big quantities, not to you or me. Probably they sell to shops, and then shops sell individually to us. They manufacture and wholesale a wide variety of products, including fashion clothes and audio-video equipment. For example, presumably, televisions. So they make and sell clothes and televisions. Now, it's not really relevant to the answer, but do you know any companies who sell clothes? And televisions? Well, yeah, department stores sell them both, but make them both. Are you currently wearing a pair of Sony trousers? Are you currently watching television on your Pierre Cardin TV? I doubt it. But not to worry, sometimes examiners come up with slightly odd concepts. It's because they're mad. But let's just forget about the examiner for the time being. Here we have a big company who make and sell a lot of stuff. At the moment, I've no idea how relevant that is. The company is audited by Verst, a firm of chartered certified accountants, and the audit manager is Darius Harkin. Now, an audit manager is not an audit partner, but an audit manager is a pretty senior person in the audit team, and that means they have quite a big impact on how the audit is carried out, the work that's done, and the conclusions, and therefore the audit report that we end up with. They will advise the partner carefully, based on what they've seen, as to what they think the outcome of the audit should be. As a basic rule, the more senior the person involved in an ethical situation, the more important it's going to be. The fact that we've been told who the audit manager is makes me suspect that in at least one of these stories, that audit manager will be making an appearance. If it's the audit manager, it's going to be serious, which means the action we take will also be serious. The following matters have arisen during the audit of the group's financial statements for the year to the 30th of June 2008. 
So the year end is the 30th of June. Don't forget, it's currently the 11th of December, over five months later. That could prove to be important. And it tells us that the audit is nearing completion. Now, this is one of the differences between a P7 question and an F8 question. On F8, the likelihood is that you discover a problem before the audit starts, which means you can deal with it before anyone's done any work. On P7, a lot of the work has already been done, which means if we're about to discover that there's someone in the audit team with an ethical issue, number one, deal with the person, number two... What do we do about the work they've already done? Now, it would appear we're about to see a few dates. I've already got two dates given to me, the year end and today. So to help us answer this question, I'm going to build up a little timeline just to organise my thoughts. There we have today's date, just so we know where we are. There's the year end for the audit that we're doing, and I've also put the previous year end in as I often find that's fairly important. And it tells us in the question that the audit is nearing completion. So let's put the audit process on this diagram. Right. That's got us set up. Let's now go, now go back to the question and see what we can find. Right, the first one. Now, there are 15 marks available for this question, and there are three stories. Presumably, therefore, without being told anything else, the best assumption is that there are five marks available for each. What does five marks actually mean? Well, quite simply, it's that you're looking to say... Five things. And we need to identify issues and suggest action. So let's assume that we probably need about three of each of those to score some decent marks. As long as you say sensible things and explain them clearly, you should be aiming for one mark per sensible comment made. Now sometimes when we do questions in this presentation, I'll simply show you an answer plan to make sure we can come up with the ideas but for this first question, I'm going to write out the entire answer that I would write, just so that you can see the level of detail and explanation that an examiner might expect. It's not just coming up with the points, it's how you explain them. OK, then, here we go with the first one. During the annual physical count of fashion clothes, so that's the stock take then, at the company's principal warehouse... The audit staff attending the count were invited to purchase any items of clothing or equipment, now read the next bit carefully, at 30% of, not off, their recommended retail prices. 30% of something means a 70% discount, not 30 Right. So, basically, the audit staff attending the stock count were told if they wished they could buy some products from Aventura at a very nice, attractive discount. Is that a good thing? Bad thing? Who knows? Let's just think back to our ethics knowledge. This would appear to be a gift, hospitality, a nice present, I don't know what you want to call it, 
but it's your client being nice to you. What are the rules on clients being nice to you? Well, with ethics, there don't tend to be rules. There tends to be guidance. And the guidance on gifts and hospitality is that in the business world, they happen. So they're not completely banned. But you need to be careful that you are not accepting gifts that might be seen as the outside world at an attempt at bribery. So anything you're given needs to be of relatively minimal value. 70% off televisions, clothes, stereo music equipment could potentially, of course, be worth a lot of money. I think the outside world might look at this as a relatively generous discount and might therefore be suspicious at, number one, the fact that the client is offering it to their auditors, and number two, if the auditor says yes. There must surely now be a threat that the client is trying to, how shall we say, persuade, or to use the ethical words, intimidate the auditors. And of course, even if the client is just being genuinely nice, if the auditors know they get a nice discount from this client, might the staff ignore errors to try to keep the client happy and therefore keep the discount for the future? A self-interest threat. So there appear to be some threats to objectivity here, and we're going to put those in our answer. When we're looking at ethics, I mentioned the seniority of staff and how important it is. So you now need to think, what sort of audit staff would attend a client's stock take? Well, why are they attending the stock take? They're attending it to see how carefully the company counts its inventory, its stocks, a sort of controls test, if you like, because the stock take is a control, so you attend, observe, and assess. And also, while they're there, they can do some substantive testing, actually checking the year-end stock lists against the stock they can actually see. Well, how clever do you need to be to watch people counting things? How clever do you need to be to count things yourself? And the answer is not that clever. So the staff who typically go to stock takes are typically fairly junior staff, trainees. Therefore, they are at the bottom of the audit team, which means they have fairly low impact on the final audit report. So in terms of the answer I want to write, I can tell you about the threats, but I can now say those threats are reduced by the fact that the staff involved are so junior that it can't have that big an impact on the final result of the audit. But I also said, always watch the dates. If a company counts its stock once a year, when is it likely to count it? And the answer is, at its year end. The question doesn't tell us, but the best assumption is that this stock count happened around about the 30th of June, five months ago. So please don't write in your answer, tell the audit staff not to accept this invitation, because surely it's too late. If I offered you a cheap TV five months ago, you wouldn't spend five months deciding whether to buy it, would you? You either say yes or you say no. It's too late. And anyway, bear in mind that even if you said no to this, surely you're still thinking what a lovely client this is for giving you the offer, even if you have to say no. So to a great extent, whether you said yes or not is actually not the point. The point is that they offered you this in the first place. And another thing, the audit is nearing completion, which means all the work these staff have been doing over the last few days and weeks has been with the full knowledge in their brains that this client's being nice to them. If it's had an effect, it's too late. Right, we've got a few ideas. We need to get these down. So let's start constructing our answer. So there, I think, is where the stock take will be happening. So we need matters and we need action. Firstly, the matters. The question's about ethics, so let's make it clear what the ethical issues are. And it's threats to objectivity.
So there's the very basic point, but we won't score much for that. We need to add some detail and talk about what types of threat and why. So there are a couple of types of threats we could mention, and in fact there is a third one as well. If I ran a business, I'd be fairly unlikely to give anybody a 70% discount. But if I do give someone a 70% discount, it's not going to just be to strangers, is it? It's going to be people who I feel friendly towards, or close to, or in technical terms, familiar with. Even if the auditors are completely honest, do the right thing, and say we can't possibly accept this. The very fact that such a big discount has been offered is a problem in itself, because it suggests that the underlying relationship between this client and the audit firm may be a bit too close. Now, at this early stage in the answer, hopefully you're looking at my answer and thinking, that's quite a detailed explanation. I could, of course, write more, but I think I've made my point about as clearly as I'm going to. To earn marks, you cannot just write two or three words or one technical term and hope that the marker will look at that and say, ah, yes, this student understands. You need to think up what the technical terms are and then build explanations around them. I'm not looking for a five-page essay. It's not needed. Two, three, four lines of writing, enough to make your point nice and clearly, then move on. OK, so we've identified some ethical threats. The next thing I mentioned was the seniority of staff and how the fact that the junior staff are likely to be going to the stock take reduces these threats a bit. So let's make that point too.
So, we've identified some threats. We've explained that the seniority of staff is fairly low in this case, which reduces those threats. And the other thing I mentioned was the dates. This stock take was over five months ago. So it's worth noting that one issue that we need to deal with in this situation is that with the stock take five months ago and the audit work almost finished, if they did accept gifts, or if they did feel what a nice client this is, whether they accepted gifts or not, any work they've already done might have been adversely affected by this. Now, of course, there is a reasonable chance that our firm will be auditing this company again next year. So we can stop this being a problem again, but unfortunately, we already have a mess to deal with this time. The problem has happened. Now, there are only five marks available for this first story, and I'm already saying quite a lot. I need to get on and start talking about what we're going to do about this. There may be other matters to mention, but we need to move on. So let's now consider action. Well, we have an audit going on which might have been adversely affected by something that happened five months ago. Potentially, we have some audit staff who may have said yes to a generous offer when, in fact, they probably should have said no. So we've got an audit to deal with, and we've also maybe got some audit staff to deal with. Also, are we not just a little bit worried that the client made such a generous offer? Maybe there's a conversation to be had with the client here as well. But before we do any of that there is some information that we don't know. For example, we don't know if our audit staff actually bought anything. If they said no, good. It doesn't completely remove the problem because the offer itself is a bit worrying, but at least if our audit staff said no, they won't have gained any benefit from it, and it means they know the principles of ethics, which would be a good thing. And there's a second thing. As you may be aware, when it comes to hospitality, gifts, presents, etc., if you're the only person getting them, then it's a bit of a worry. If the client regularly gives these discounts to everybody, they're probably not trying to bribe you, are they? You can't bribe everybody. Bear in mind, after all, that some companies, if you look in shop windows, always seem to be having a 70% off sale. And if they are the auditors are actually getting no benefit at all, are they? So there are two things I'd like to find out. My first action will be to ask some questions. Did my audit staff buy anything? And the client sales invoices should indicate if that's true or not. And secondly, I need to find out if the client offers such a generous discount to anybody else. For example, maybe their own staff. Again, it won't completely get rid of the problem, but it will make me feel a little better if I know they're not just trying to bribe the auditors.
Now, notice as I do the answer, I don't just say do this. I say do this and why. Always try to justify what you're saying. Explain why you want to do something. Sometimes it may feel a little obvious, but it just proves to the markers that you haven't just learned a list of things to do. You're actually thinking about why. OK, once we've got that information, I suspect it's time to act. Firstly, the staff involved. If they did accept this generous discount, and we're only finding this out now, it suggests that they accepted the discount without asking their manager or partner whether they should. Now, with such a generous discount, trainees should be trained not to immediately say yes. They should consult more senior colleagues. So one thing we might wish to suggest is some training for the trainees on this audit and maybe the entire firm to remind them of their responsibilities regarding professional ethics. Now, we can probably make sure this problem never causes a problem again by making sure that the staff who went to the audit this year are now taken off this client and don't do next year's audit. A bit of team rotation at this point might be a good idea. We might also want to discuss with the client and try to make sure that this offer is not made in the future, or at least if it is, the discount's a lot lower. Now, we need to do that fairly carefully. It may be the client is just being generous, and to have that offer thrown back in their face wouldn't be such a good thing. So that needs to be carefully handled, probably by the partner. Well, this is all fine, but I can't help feeling we're dealing with the easier aspects of the situation. What about the audit work that these staff have already carried out? I mean, they may have been doing all of this work with a little thought going round in their mind, I must not upset this client, I want a cheap television. So what do we do? Get the staff to give anything back if they've bought anything? 
Well, that would upset the client, probably upset our staff, and it wouldn't achieve anything anyway, would it? They've already done the audit work. Giving the stuff back now doesn't help. And anyway, why would the company want a five-month-old pair of trousers or a five-month-old TV back? It's a waste of time. The work has already been done. There might be problems with that work. Now, being work done by junior staff, presumably it's already been reviewed by someone a bit more senior. Given that we know that there is a bigger issue now, I suspect it would be wise to re-review that work. Of course, even if the work is reviewed, there's no guarantee, even if there are problems, that the audit documentation shows those problems up. This is not a perfect solution. But it's probably the best you can do. I suppose if you had any concerns having done this, that the audit staff might not have done the work properly, you might actually have to repeat some of that work and get different staff onto the audit team to do it. But realistically, their junior staff, their work is carefully reviewed, I suspect we would probably be best letting those audit staff finish the current audit, review their work carefully, and that's probably the best we'll do. But if there is any suspicion that something's gone wrong, get those staff off the audit team and replace them with some other trainees. And that is pretty much the answer I would write in the exam. Time allowing, of course. Um, naturally, I hope, I can come up with quite a lot of points. And there is a danger that because the exam is set by an examiner who doesn't expect people to write as much as this, there is a danger that a good quality student has so much to write, they run out of time. So you need to think quickly, plan your answer, and get your points down as quickly as possible but do make sure you think and plan first. Well, clearly, if you count up the number of points I've made there, it's a lot more than five. So no one's expecting you to get all of these. But notice the framework I've followed. When talking about the matters, what are the ethical issues? How junior or senior are the people involved? And watch the dates. When it comes to actions, deal with the staff, deal with the audit, and if possible, try to make sure this never happens again. OK, that's the first one done. We've taken a while doing it because I've been explaining in full as we go through. And as I said, that is what I'd actually write in the exam. Just to speed things up a bit, and now you've got the idea, for the last two bits of the question, I won't write the answer out in full. I'll show you an answer plan so that you can see the sort of points I'd be making. <laughs> 